Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this next installment of Navigating the New Normal. I am Dion Gordon, and this is Tech Birmingham. Um, I have to, of course, give a shout out to the awesome, amazing team that puts up with my inappropriate rap questions, <laughs> Christina Smith and Rebecca Dobrinsky. Um, as you all know, they keep this ship running and they cover a multitude of my sins. I'm grateful for them. And we are grateful for you all as well for taking time to join us uh, for this webinar. Uh, as you all have guessed, we have some rock stars uh, who are going to deliver some pretty good insights uh, around data. And uh, before we get into that though, I wanna make sure that I do um, impress upon you all the importance of joining uh, Tech Birmingham. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking to some individuals outside of the region um, and um, just going down the list of things that have taken place in our ecosystem over the past three to four years is actually quite remarkable. Uh, and you all are a part of that. And so we look at you all as a part of this community. And by being a member, you uh, strengthen our voice as a community and allow us to really help Birmingham level up, um, especially as it relates to technology and innovation. So if you are not a member, I would love to have you all join. If your organization is not a member, please impress upon them the importance of that. Um, and if you are a member, make sure you reach out to us as well. We have a lot that's gonna be on the slate for 2021. And so we wanna make sure um, that we're engaged with you all, that we are getting the feedback uh, and the ideas and the insights um, that would really uh, bring value to you personally as well as your organization. So, um, and as always, make sure uh, you check out the YouTube cha channel. We post all of these uh, shortly after um, the conclusion. And you can find that at youtube.com slash techbham. And the website uh, for membership and more is techbirmingham.com. Now that that is out of the way, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator. Um, she obviously is no stranger to the uh, Birmingham scene, uh, whether that's innovation, technology, data, or otherwise. She is just a remarkable contributor uh, to what it is we are doing uh, around this region. Uh, she is a former Tech Birmingham board member. Uh, she is the co-founder of Think Data Solutions. And I'm sure you all are familiar with the work that she does around LinkedIn learning as an instructor, uh, as well as an instructor for Innovate Birmingham. So um, I am proud to call her a friend. And with that said, I will kick it over to you, uh, Miss Invisibility, Robin Hunt. Thank you for that amazing introduction. So yeah, I'm Robin Hunt and a huge fan of Tech Birmingham, super huge fan of data, anything data, I love it uh, and love to talk about it, love to share it, and love to teach people and educate people and really love to build tools around it. So I am just a super, super fan and today's conversation, they called me a moderator, but I really want it to be conversational uh, with these guys. So I have uh, Vinay Balt here with Shipped. So Vinay, wave at everybody. And also Ben Podobielski. I did it again. Pod -biel -el uh. Can we, can we stop the recording? Just kidding. I practiced that well, like a thousand times in my head and makes, out loud. If it makes you feel better, Robin, <laughs> I totally skipped over the housekeeping that Christina was going to offer up. So uh, I, think yeah. I, just, I screwed it up. That's I, okay. I yeah. That's <laughs> okay. That's okay. Christina, do you want to cover housekeeping while I recover from butchering Ben P's name again? <laughs> Uh, sure, I will. Um, I will just let everyone know, remind everyone who has been with us. And if you're new, so this is going to be the Robin will be uh, facilitating the discussion. Um, but as the audience members, if you have any questions, or if you have any insights that you would like to share, please feel free to put those in the chat box. We also have a Q&A feature. And so you could either put them in the Q&A or the chat. And we will help field all of those questions to Robin and to um, our guests. But thank you um, for all of you being here. And Ben, it's not too early for Christmas. <laughs> you know, okay, so back to me. And I'm not going to try again to say Ben's name. Um, it's, it's almost unfair. I see Ben all the time. He'll, for, he'll forgive me. 
So I have really four categories for our conversation, which is some personal data related questions for these guys, as well as questions around the organization level for them and other organizations that maybe they can make some suggestions for. And then also data questions around uh, inspiring and aspiring data workers. So I think I just want to jump right into it. I, I know that for me, when anybody asked me to speak about data, one of the very first questions out of their mouth is how do you define data? And it's super hard for me to feel that question because like there's not a single catchy answer or phrase that really sums up the mass of what which is data. Um, I typically refer to it as the ocean. It's large. There's a lot of it. There's a lot in it. And there's still a lot undiscovered. So it's really hard to break it down. So I ask you guys, you know, do you get the same type of question when people discover your data people? And, uh, and how do you answer it with that catchy one sentence phrase? So Ben, what's your, what's your thoughts? Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, I think uh, I have never had anyone ask me what uh, I defined as data before. So that's, uh, that's going to be a new question for me. But um, I, I really look at it. I think most people will think of data and immediately go to Excel. They go to databases and they need to look at it a bigger picture. It's really not, it encompasses those, but it's really a, as a captured observation. It is not necessarily saying one thing or another. It is just an observation. Uh, it is a point in time or a sets of point in time of information that has been captured via various sources or methods, and it is stored in a location that can be then leveraged for other use cases. Um, I, I think the one thing that everyone can, thinks about is like, oh, well, the data says X, Y, and Z. And I think too often when you start to say the data says something, there's this whole idea of psychology where the correlation does not prove causation that we have to be very careful of. Uh, but I do think that, you know, data, as much as we need to define it as a truth, uh, it is just an observation and data can be wrong. I, I do think, you know, there are certain methods and, you know, processes that are involved in the capturing process where data is not always the truth. Uh, it is just observation that exists within that time period. Uh, and it is not the end all be all per se. Yeah. So when I was recording um, learning data analytics, I created a chapter called the truths and covered there's a data truth, a business truth and a statistics truth so that we could start at the very beginning people understanding that there there are, are multiple truths and sometimes they're not the overall truth of data. Vina, how about you? I, I think Ben actually summed it up better than I would have myself that um, it's, it's an observation. Uh, and I think the, the idea that the data says something, I, I think um, we often hear let the data speak for itself, but the observations by themselves don't typically do that. Um, I, I feel like we think about there's like a hierarchy of like there's data, which are observations, there's actual information, which layers on some context. Then we start connecting those bits of information. We have insights and so on. And so I think um, Ben was spot on. Uh, I, I can't really ramble on too much more about what no. he said. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that leads me into this. So again, as we were talking earlier before we went in here, I, I started my career when people were still trying to figure out how to put servers in their closets with enough air conditioning. So I've been around for a while. I was doing things that are considered data best practices um, before they had names. And so as I've grown in my career and in age, I, I've started noticing buzzwords. And when I hear the buzzwords, and then when I hear people use them, it almost makes me want to throw up in my mouth a little bit. So uh, I wanted to ask you, what are the buzzwords for you that when you hear them, you're like, it just kind of gives you a uh, kind of feeling. But now how about we start with you on this one? I, I think the one that bugs me the most is uh, big data. Um, it's pretty much impossible to find. And anybody who asks you like, or who tries to offer a definition, they typically start with like this idea of, well, it's high volume. Um, there's a lot of it, but then there's also a variety of it. Uh, and then it's also coming at you quickly. And I'm like, okay, so like this is a, I'll recognize it if I see it kind of issue. Um, so I, I think the rise of quote unquote big data, most of us 
as analysts or um, and so on, like we're not necessarily downloading terabytes and terabytes of data for our own analysis. A company may collect that much, but it doesn't mean that it all has to fit in our computer. Um, I think there's there's probably a smaller one around deep dives that bugs me sometimes about data of like, sometimes we're actually looking for a quick answer um, and that's what the business wants. Sometimes we really want a true deep dive of like, okay, we need to make, make this an airtight case, but um, big data is one that has confused me for a while, even being in the data space. Yeah, I love that. How about you, Ben? Uh, you know, I'm definitely going to agree with an eye. I think uh, big data is a, is a big one. Uh, I, that one gets thrown around a lot. Um, the other one that really frustrates me is uh, AI. I think everyone slaps artificial intelligence or machine learning on everything. Uh, just because you have an algorithm doesn't mean it's a machine learning algorithm or it's artificial intelligence. Uh, and I think that's what we continue to see is I, I've sat in vendor presentations and I've listened to them talk about, oh, our AI does this and it does that. And you get into it, it's like, no, that, that's not artificial intelligence. That's literally an if then statement. That is, no, <laughs> I need you to stop. Like, please, <laughs> uh, you're embarrassing yourself. Uh, <laughs> that's tough. And, and I think that's actually the joke, uh, like in Silicon Valley, the if then equals AI is like, it, it's, it's what actually a lot of people say. It's, um, I feel like every startup is talking about how they're layering on AI and their solution. It's, I'm like, I'm not so sure about that. Yes. <laughs> if I'm a salesperson for technology and then I do, I do my due diligence and understand you two are coming in, that has to probably be a super intimidating thing for those guys, especially when they're going to use those buzzwords as part of their pitch and have really no clue. I mean, even to any level of what they're talking about. That's funny. Again, makes the case for data literacy at all levels. So I can remember the first moment that I was seeing data differently than other people because I just could look at these systems that were so different from each other. They were not stored together. Their outputs were completely different and I could just look at it and understand how to tie it together. And then I had to learn how to communicate it back where they would believe me when I said it, right? And so being in us talking about this, I, I, I see that you had sort of a shared experience there. So do you remember what it was like to realize you were a little bit different than the people you were talking to or working with? You know, I, I think the one story that comes to mind um, was uh, we, uh, we had a system at Protective called uh, CKE, which is our precursor to our enterprise data warehouse. And as we had this giant initiative coming in that was really gonna start to be the first one to really leverage the EDW, uh, we had to figure out, all right, what's the, what's the data quality in here? And no one up until that point had done any type of quality analysis. And so I got tasked with it and they said, hey, do you mind taking a look? And I was like, yeah, sure, of course not. I remember sitting down, looking through every one of the tables uh, that exist in the EDW, as well as all the landing tables from all the source systems, and it, it making sense. Uh, you know, it, you sit there and I talked to all these people who have looked at it, we had contractors coming in and all these tons of people who had worked on it and no one had any clue really how a, a lot of it worked. We had definitely a group that did, but a lot of people looked at it and were just confused. And I remember just sitting there and like the puzzle pieces fit like everything just matched up. I understood how the NDM process worked. I understood all that was integrated. And, uh, you know, because of that, like performing a data quality analysis, which ended up kind of laying the precursor to a lot of their uh, automated deployment uh, uh, testing now, uh, it just, it was a natural fit for me. But it was definitely interesting when you're sitting there, I hold this huge binder with all the data quality, quality analysis results and talking through it and explaining how it works and seeing blank faces on people's face. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, so this is this is not normal. Okay, good enough. Um, yeah. This is not what most people understand. Okay. That's funny. But now, how about you? I think for me, it's um, I, like I, I recognize Ben's story from like a data engineering, data warehousing space. Um, it's like it's hard to keep all that in, in, in sort of a mental model. And that's actually a pretty rare skill, I would say. Um, I think for me specifically, it's partly being within data, but sometimes asking for either more data or to caution against, hey, I know this is what these results were, but basically it's equivalent of like your mileage may vary. And I, I see this sometimes when we, we run a lot of tests and we have a short-term result, but potentially with long-term implications. And our nature, like 
I, I think a lot of our companies probably talk about being data driven, data focused in some way. And we see, oh, hey, like the test was better. Let's roll it out. Um, but then sometimes some things like retention or engagement, they take longer uh, to play out than what the business is willing to tolerate for the test. And so one of the interesting things I think is sometimes I'm, I'm in the data world, like knee deep, obviously, but at the same time, sometimes I'm like, hey, like, let's use our intuition sometimes in addition to the data, which I, I think uh, the data science group at, at least at CHIP seems to appreciate. Um, but sometimes it, it, it's the first look is like, you're the data guy. Like the data shows that p-value was, you know, um, less than 0.05. So like, we're good to go. And it's like, well, like, Maybe. let's think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Sometimes, um, so my family, because again, I've, I've, well, I've been an entrepreneur for a decade and my family will ask me, you know, well, what is it that you do? And I'm just like, I just, I just say computers, <laughs> just the computers, because it's hard enough to describe it to people that you're engaged with, right? And that, that blank face is when I, I'm looking for that blank face. I've finally learned to look for the blank face because that tells me I got to dial it back just a little bit, right? So I can get across what I'm trying to get across. I also found in my own career too that it's as much about the data we have as the data we don't have. And I was able to start interpreting like, okay, well, yeah, I see this, but I don't see this. Where is this? And if it didn't exist, we had to figure out either a mathematical way to create it or we had to start capturing it. So awesome. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, data at your organizations because I mean, protective is over a hundred years old. So, you know, there's a lot of processes that have, you know, been in place for a really long time. And again, before computers were ever at anybody's desks. Uh, so it's a different organism than uh, a company like Shipped, which how old is Shipped at this point, Benai? Uh, I think we're officially about six years old and about okay. five and a half years of uh, grocery deliveries. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation because I think you know, the, the idea that people interpret data differently because of the age of their company, the size of their company, uh, all of those things is really, I, I, I think we're more together than what people would think we are. So I really love the fact that you guys are willing to come have this conversation. So I want to ask both of you to talk about some of the misconceptions that you face internally at your organizations and I don't really care who goes first on this. I mean, there's a ton of misconceptions around data. So we face them in every company, right? So yeah, talk to me about the misconceptions you guys face. I don't mind starting. Um, I think uh, one of the big things is that, you know, being a 113 year old company, uh, I think obviously, as you mentioned, you know, we were founded and essentially as a data organization before data was digital. Uh, I mean, if you really want to think about it, uh, you know, looking at life insurance and annuities and any type of insurance space, uh, what we're doing is essentially predicting a, you know, that an event is going to occur. Uh, and so you go back to 1907 when we were founded in Birmingham, and we were doing that on pens and paper, probably like pencils and paper back then, uh, maybe even quill, who knows. Um, but like, that was something that we were founded on as an organization. So you think with 113 years worth of data that, Obviously, we'd get you know pretty good at utilizing it to some extent, yes, but also a lot of the data is not usable. Um, you really you go back to a certain time period and you either have issues with the data capturing methods, you have issues with bias that existed in you know who our customer base was back then. Uh, you look back at the 40s and 50s, and honestly, you know that customer is drastically different from the customer we have today. Even though that customer that we sold back in the 40s and 50s may still be a customer today. But it, it, so it's a it's a very unique uh, you know situation with data because it is such a long tail industry. Um, it's kind of drastically different. You know we're we're literally trying to predict an event that's going to occur 60, 70 years from now, um, and you know our our window of uh, you know plus minus maybe a year or two is kind of what the goal is. Versus you look at someone like Shift and when I could talk about this, where it's like your prediction is probably almost on an hourly or daily basis. Um, and so like it's a whole different animal, even though we're both utilizing data and we're both, you know, trying to understand how to interpret that data that we have. We both have massive amounts. It's a different use case and a different problem set that we have. Um, I do think, you know, the time scale is obviously a big thing for us in a lot of ways. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's definitely it's interesting uh, because you know, like I said, 113 years old, millions of customers, but you know, you still can't use everything that you uh, you think you'd be able to use. Absolutely, one of the things that um, Vana said in his um, conversations up to this point was the misconception of count, which you know. You may have changed my life on that one. That was a good one. I'm probably going to use it and steal it from you because it was okay. so good. It's it's really a profound thought. So if I could maybe take you down that direction of talking about the count, I just think that was just really awesome insight. Yeah, for sure. I think um, I, I think that's one of the common misconceptions we have. Uh, sometimes it shifts, but also in my experience in, in data organizations is that count basically has two meanings. And one is... Um, one is to tabulate, right? One is just to like mark down, okay, I, I gave a loan to this person or I, I, you know, somebody bought an annuity, kind of like Ben was describing. The other one is sort of, the other meaning of count is uh, around value or worth. And so one of the challenges I think we have is as we grow as companies, as we evolve as companies, we really need to measure what matters and basically what counts. And I think one of the challenges that I've seen is that, okay, let's measure everything. Let's, let's count everything and then we'll be able to make a perfect decision. But not everything has, not all these observations basically as Ben was describing earlier, they, they're not all equally important or equally valuable on a go forward basis. Um, and I think that's something that we have to really sort of, especially with our business partners drive home that hey, if we want to measure something new, we really have to start thinking about it fresh, kind of like you said, Robin. We didn't need to infer what happened here or we're going to have to instrument something new to track it. Um, but then also we need to be really diligent about measuring what matters as we go along because the same things that shift measure when I started in 2016, like some of those things are not that important. Um, the business has evolved we're like, uh, and so on. And so I think um, this idea of like, counting both as tabulation, but also as value is, is really integral for us. It's like we talk to our business partners and within the data org of like, okay, this is what we need to be focused on. Yeah, I think that's why it's so good when you work in teams of data literate people, because you can have that discussion on the count idea, right? So yeah, we can count it, but does it count? I just think that is just hugely impactful. And, you know, I would say, if you're talking to an organization, like maybe that's a really great place to start. Cause again, some things you're going to have to kind of work through to determine, you know, we, in our, in our data research team where we study early childhood education, we do what we call the worth it test. So we'll do a sample study to determine if it's worth it or not to pursue it before we invest a lot of time and effort and write standards around it. So, yeah, how many people in your organizations are actually, you know, utilizing data? I, basically 100%. Um, I think, obviously, like data and finance are using data all the time. Marketing's using it to figure out what campaign should we be running? How should we target people? The product team is using it from sometimes quantitative, sometimes qualitative data to figure out, okay, Here's user research, here are surveys about what people are looking for, what kind of experience they're having. And even our, um, our X team, which is our experience team that interacts with members and shoppers who might be running challenges, they can call, chat, and so on. Um, our X team is using data all the time. They pull up a member's profile and they understand, oh, you know, like Bob has placed 100 orders over time. Like basically his, his value to shift is pretty high. Um, we really need to take care of him on this one. Um, or a shopper is struggling figuring out how to, I don't know, check out with like a random weight item. Um, there's there's things that our, our X team has in our admin portal to manage that, but all of them have to up and down the board. We're all dealing with data all the time. We're making decisions with data or we're, we're reading data and results off of sort of the, a dashboard or portal to be able to inform those decisions. So I think, I think it's across the board. Awesome. Yeah. Ben, how about at Protective? Like what's the, What's the data usage there? Yeah, no, I see the exact same thing. It's everywhere from, you know, customer service, maintenance, all the way up to C levels. I think there's not a single person in the organization that's not using it to some extent. Um, I think actually to give a little plug for, you know, 
I be here. I think one of the things that's always interesting for me to see is, you know, candidates coming out of Innovate Birmingham's data analytics class, the jobs that they place in are just as diverse as what we're talking about here. And I, I think that's actually, you know, a prime example is you look and they're, they're in anything from a data analyst job to, you know, a QA job to all these different jobs. So they're coming out and taking jobs all across organizations. And so I think that's a prime example of, you know, recent graduates who are showing that, hey, data is not just, you know, data science. It's not just IT. It's not just where you typically think about it. It is every aspect of the organization. Yeah, I, I love being a partner to Innovate Birmingham and developing that curriculum. And one thing I can say is the students who really dig into that, that they come out being extremely data literate. And we also are able to gauge their aptitude and determine like which areas should they go down, right? Like you can you can pick up someone who maybe has uh, an interest and should be pursuing uh, data engineering. Like you can see those things out of that boot camp. And yeah, I, I'm pretty proud of where they're going to. And I always tell them, hey, it's not your first job out of this boot camp; it's your second job, where it really starts to make a difference. Uh, but yeah, we're pretty proud of the product we create there and. And the students really, if they dig in, it, it really can be a life changing thing for them. So yeah, thanks for that shout out. Innovate Birmingham, keep going. Uh, it's fun to, to build that curriculum and, and watch it evolve and change and, and tweak. And then of course we get down into the skill sets, right? Like you have to have some baseline skills to, to figure out. SQL is usually a good identifier like when we get to the SQL stuff, right? Okay, so, um, Let's talk about other organizations. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on your organizations. But if you could advise every organization on earth to invest in data literacy, would you and what outcomes do you think you would, would see for those organizations? You know, uh, I, I do think that it should be something every organization tries for. Um, there's a uh, MIT professor by the name of Eric Von Hippel who's wrote a series of books about innovation. Uh, and his big concept in a number of his books is the idea behind user innovation. It's the fact that a user is closer to a problem and is better able to define a solution for that problem. And, and I think that's what you see with a lot of employees as you increase their data literacy, they're able to better understand what exists around them and how to better define solutions around that. I think that's why you're seeing kind of a, a recent surge in the idea behind of a citizen data scientist is the term that we're seeing utilized a lot lately, where organizations are really developing internal platforms to allow their employees who aren't typically considered high data skill people to go out there and start to leverage data for their own uses. And I think that's where you start to see the benefit for it as more and more people are exposed to more and more data and they start to understand how it exists in the organization, what that means and how to use it for their jobs. Because those are the people that are gonna understand how data can be leveraged better than anyone else. Uh, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of it. I think it's something that everyone is organization should strive for. I think, you know, shout out for this month being Data Literacy Month. Uh, you know, I, I think that should be worth mentioning as well. Uh, and hopefully everyone takes advantage of it. Yeah, I agree. But now what's your thoughts on the investment in data literacy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a slam dunk for sure. I, I think, um, like, same with Ben, that it's 100% of our company using data. Uh, and, like, not everybody can have a data analyst follow them around to every meeting and decision. Um, and one of the principles of the data science team at Shift is really around self-service. Uh, and so we will surface insights, uh, we will share those out, but we also want to be able to you know, allow our team members across the company to interact with uh, data in Tableau, for example, or interact in some of our tools. Um, one of the things I think that, like, and, and, and I say data literacy is important, we probably didn't focus in, on it as much at Shift until actually this year. Um, and so we started actually uh, specifically a data learning and library program. We're walking through a lot of stuff in Tableau, how to not only read like dashboards and read charts, but also how to use, especially the self-service aspects, to answer questions that people have in certain departments. So that way they can become better at sort of interrogating what's happened, but also making decisions as a result. Absolutely. So both of you just, just you know, singing my song. Um, I, uh, I think that probably what happened for me in my career, I was so fortunate for all the decisions that I didn't know I was making 
but because I was, I was surrounded by technical people who would eventually grow up and be in IT departments, but I was dealing daily with the end user. And they were coming at that time because, you know, these, these tools, I'm afraid to say, are fairly new at that point in time, and they needed to learn things about them. But it was understanding not just the skill, but I, I, I figured out pretty quickly I was teaching them the application of it, right? So they could learn how to do it, but then I could teach them how to apply it and again, they would bring me their problems. Like they weren't showing up to training because somebody required them to be there most of the time. They were coming because they were struggling. And, you know, frankly, not every single problem <clears throat> that a department or an end user is going to face in the back office is going to get a $100,000 software development budget to automate it. Like they have to be able to self-serve, like you said. So um, I've been fortunate to be able to support end users at that level, but I was able to talk to IT guys, right? And I, I remember early on, like the IT department was like, you, nobody got to IT. The only way to IT was a help desk ticket. Yep. Uh, but I was like, I can't do this job without IT. I, I have to have IT support. So um, I knew, and I used to joke, I'd be like one day all of the end users are going to be technical people. And I, I feel like we're seeing some of that now of course it's two decades later but whatever it's happening again i love it and I, I think there's a lot of need for data literacy if you could share like one of your uh organizational best practices with everybody what would you what would you say is one of your best practices um so i, I think the main thing i would call out is how we surface insights to the broader group um, so the, w the way that shift is organized internally is um, we have like a marketing analytics team, we have a operations analytics team, and it's very easy then for some of those findings and insights to be siloed, right? They're partnering with their department. So what we try and do is bubble those up a level. So at the data science manager level, whether it's analytics manager or machine learning or whatnot, we try and collaborate at that level and then share out to actually the entire company. So we do these monthly insight reports um, where we try and bubble up the biggest findings, some of the key experiments and results. So that way, hey, we ran this test, it worked. Here's why we think it worked. We ran this other test, it didn't actually move the needle. Um, here's why we didn't do it, or here's why we think it didn't work out. Um, and then that way we try and take what, frankly, was actually probably a little bit more siloed earlier at shift um, and try and bubble that up. because. I mean, I, I can only imagine how big uh, Ben's company is at this point, but um, Shift has grown a lot from, I think when I joined, there were about 80 people and now we're over 1,200. It's way harder to share information amongst mm -hmm. 1,200 people than when, hey, we could all just like do a company all hands basically every week. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, we're at 3,500, so you, you've, got a, you've got a little bit to go. Um, but <laughs> I, I do think that as you get bigger, and it's one of the things that actually comes to my mind, because I'm definitely in a way of the, the corporate flag here a little bit more than the startup flag, is the idea of governance. Uh, you know, I think what we've seen is you get a large, to, or a large corporation that marketing is going to have their own definition of a sale. Sales is going to have their own definition of a sale. Uh, you know, our distribution is going to have their own definition of a sale. IT is going to have their own definition of a sale. Suddenly you're dealing with seven different people who all have their own definitions and they're wondering why their numbers don't match up. Right. So Amen. Well, congrats. You're all working in giant silos, so it's not going to work this way. Uh, so I do think that one of the things that, you know, it's something that we've been definitely been focusing on here at Protective is creating that idea of data governance. The idea where this is what this term means in the process with the entire business process, a sale is defined as X, Y, and Z. You know, we define a commission as X, Y, and Z. We define this event as this, this, and this. Here's what it means in this admin system. Unfortunately, we've got like 30 of the admin systems, so here are the other 29 of those. Uh, and, and that's the thing that we've got to define out, but we've got to set that standard as an organization so that when we do a reporting, everyone is on the exact same page about what that reporting is and what it means. Because otherwise you just end up with a whole mess of stuff that's happening and no one has any real clue. Yeah. Uh, and so again, we face this in our early childhood research too. Like, you know, we have cohort definitions of when the children come in and when you're looking at this particular distinction, this is what this means. We spent so much time talking about just the definitions before we ever really started diving into the, to the data. And I have some more thoughts on that. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, even at our size, um, governance is a big thing. Uh, 
we started with a lot of uh, fragmented definitions of, hey, when has a customer churned, for example? Sometimes they don't actually cancel, they just stop placing orders, right? Um, what is, uh, how do we measure, for, especially for different retail partners, what is on-shelf availability look like, right? They may have their own internal metrics. We may want to standardize one across shift. Uh, so how do we work with a Publix or a Target or an HEB who all might have different definitions? Um, Piggly Wiggly has their own too. So like, I, everybody's got their own in a way and, and we're kind of sitting in the middle there. So how do we govern that? And that, that that's I, like, I'd be curious how Ben saw, has solved it, hopefully, um, but we're still working through that challenge. I'm sure it's a moving target. You know what I mean? That's like when I read any, when I read anything data related, that's the first thing I'm going to is, okay, yeah, they're saying that. How do they define that? Give me the definition of that. Like I can't even move forward with the thought until I know, like, what is, you know, what key definition have you set there for me to understand what I'm actually reading? Because it can be very, very deceptive in what you see if those key terms are not defined. Well, and the other part there is when you start to go through that process of defining what it means, someone is going to get hurt. Because someone's <laughs> statistics is no longer going to be in their favor, and someone is not going to be happy. So yeah. it's, I hate to say it, but honestly, it ends up becoming almost like this political game where you have to figure out, like, how do I appease as many people as possible to ensure that we can all come to one definition? And you end up pulling yourself out of this data role and having to put yourself into a politician role. Yeah. Uh, and it is, it's not easy. Uh, and I, I do think that is something, as Robin, you mentioned, where it's a moving target. We have to figure that out. But I, I do think that, you know, the organization has kind of figured out, it's like, hey, if we define this all in the same thing, then you don't need 17 people all trying to do one report because you're manually pulling everything together. Suddenly we can work on this a lot easier. And those people can be working on things that are a lot more important than figuring out one number. Uh, and so I think that's kind of the benefit you have to kind of pose to them is like, yes, I understand this first quarter may suck. I, it'll get better, I promise. Like you'll see how you can even out. Um, but I, it's definitely a, it's a, it's not a fun process by any means. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but it's so necessary. It's so necessary. And as I prepare to do uh, conversations on governance, I will be talking to both of you from your perspectives, for sure. Um, I've worked a lot in regulated industry. So I mean, I, I'm familiar with it there, but it would just definitely, uh, I think it would be a fun conversation to have. I don't know who who thinks data governance conversations are fun. This just explains <laughs> how exactly how geeky I really am when it comes to all this stuff. So we're, we're getting close to the end of time and I, I want to um, take us into, again, the aspiring uh, data workers. I like to call them data workers. I think data analyst means one thing, but data worker is a little bit more broad. And um, I, I thought, again, it was very fascinating. You, you have totally different perspectives from your organizations and your uh, experiences, but both of you, when I ask you about, you know, the gap in skills you 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 both basically said in different words the exact same thing and one of the things you mentioned is finding challenges in hiring people with data engineering skills so i thought maybe i would ask you why do you think it's so hard to fill data engineering roles like why is it hard to identify them and why are those roles hard to fill oh okay um I, yeah i think I, I thought it was amusing that when Ben and I were chat, like sharing some of the some thoughts that we both came up with data engineering and um, I think it's twofold on from my perspective. One is it feels relatively new. Um, I think uh, for like when I graduated in college, actually the most common job for like a stats major was to go into actuarial sciences. Um, so most of my graduating class basically is working with Ben at this point. Um, I, and, and so data engineering wasn't really a topic and it's, it's specialized form of software engineering, I would say that's much more of a data worker kind of focus. Um, so the recency piece is a challenge and I think it's also a less visible role. Um, we talk about software engineering and you're building apps like um, I know Apple's got something going on right, like right now today, for example, data science uh, gets a lot of the, the headlines because people are building models, they're doing machine learning. Um, sometimes they're not doing machine learning, but they, they're still doing machine learning. Um, <laughs> and data engineering kind of sits sometimes as the key enabler that's a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and so I, I think that's the place where um, we have a definite shortage. I know 
uh, at SHIP, I think we've got somewhere around 15 to 20 official data engineers. Um, but we, I, like, we could easily hire a lot more um, to sort of satisfy how data hungry the business is and how important it is for those guys uh, to often be shaping the data in a way that meets the governance standards, yeah. facilitating some of that self-service. Yeah, awesome. I, I definitely echo that. Um, I, I think, you know, as you know, when I mentioned that data science is the, the flashy thing that everyone wants to talk about, uh, it's like, oh, hey, we're gonna go build this model. Um, the statistic they forget to always mention is that of the companies that have invested in artificial intelligence or machine learning, 90% of them haven't put a single model in production. And that gap is really where this data engineering role is coming into play is where, you know, obviously data engineering encompasses a number of things, but from the AI standpoint, uh, it is the translation of that model into something that can be utilized in a software product. And that is not something that people necessarily thought through. They always were like, oh, I want to be able to predict X, Y, and Z, which is great. Now put it in your app. And that is not that is literally a square peg round hole situation mm -hmm. where, you know, just because you can do something, you know, sitting over here and, you know, you know, whatever it may be, whether you're using, you know, PyTorch or whatever it is, it doesn't mean that that's going to be able to be leveraged by a C-sharp application. So I, I think that is, that's definitely a gap. And then you have the actual, the data component itself, of like preparing the data, making sure the data is in an available state for that, you know, that model or, you know, just a, you know, general application. And I think that is something that most people, as when I mentioned, it's like, it's behind the scenes. It's not something you see every day. That person is not going to be standing in front of, you know, the CEO claiming an award for predicting what the churn rate is going to be for the next, you know, 15 years. That's not going to be what this person to be doing. So it's not as grandiose per se. Uh, however, that is, uh, you know, I think the, the equivalent is kind of like a goalkeeper uh, in soccer. It's that person behind the scenes that you need to make sure is there and make sure that they're good and they're gonna do everything they can to make sure you guys keep going, but they're not gonna get a single bit of credit for it. Uh, and so I think that's, it, it's definitely a missing gap for a lot of organizations. Um, I think, you know, you know, as I mentioned, they've got 15, we've got a number, we could easily use a lot more. Uh, and I think that's definitely a huge area for people looking to get into data. If you have the right skill set, it's a great opportunity. I absolutely agree. I, I think probably what I, I, there's there's huge numbers of need of people at every data level and so when we all start with data science at the top again and those roles are not there's not ever going to be a vast amount of people that are data scientists so like if you're trying to achieve that you have to understand you're going into a small set of people to compete it again so at every level, there are different amounts of jobs that will potentially be available to you. So I think it's, uh, it's key that we start identifying that there are more levels to data and data roles than just the bottom tier and the top tier, right? Just, let's, let's fill in that great middle and drive all of our organizations forward. So that's awesome. Okay, so I see we're so close on time and I know probably there are some questions from our uh, listening audience, I hope this has been beneficial to you guys hearing us have this conversation. I could talk about this all the time, every day for hours on end, because uh, I geek out about it and I love it. Um, so I see one from uh, the fabulous Haley Kendrick. What tips do you have for early stage companies to build data focused, data literate from the start? So one thing um, SHIP did, I think, in the early days was uh, we're a multi-sided marketplace. So there's potentially a lot of places to apply data. Marketing could be operations, could be on the product side, and could be to sales and so on. Um, we chose the first application of data to be primarily actually the operations side. Um, and we thought about, we, we chose that in a way because our, our promise is basically the customer will get you what you want when you want it. Um, and so we knew that we couldn't peanut butter spread data analysts or data workers across all these organizations. So we actually, uh, honestly, I, I basically told marketing, for example, you're on your own until we can grow the team, but we're starting with operations. Um, and so we built sort of a data focus there. Um, and we slowly sort of 
broaden that focus over time. So we couldn't do it all just like, okay, we're just gonna hire dozens of data workers immediately. Um, so we chose to start with one use case and area and sort of grow from there. Um, I think to the data literacy point, like I, it's a challenge because we're growing not only as a business, but also in terms of the people themselves. So um, like I said, we've added, uh, we're, we've added more than a thousand people include some turnover and who knows how many exactly it is um, since the start. And so data literacy is, I think it was important at the start, but now it's, it's only becoming more important as the, the scale grows. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that, I think that's definitely a really good point, um, would be, uh, you know, capture everything. Uh, um, even when you don't think you need it, capture it. Uh, you know, I think as you look at an organization, just because you know, you don't think, you know, today I'm only focused on X, Y, and Z. If you have an opportunity when you're starting the organization to capture, you know, anything that's out there, do it. Um, take advantage of, you know, the, you know, the green field that exists. You're not dealing with tech debt. You're not dealing with anything like that. Just open it wide, see how much data you can get, because the more the barrier, even if short term, you're not utilizing it. Long term, you'll end up benefiting off of it. Yeah. And I would also say, in addition to that, to your, to your capture it, like be sure you capture it. Um, don't get so bent out of shape how you capture it at the beginning. Just get it captured because data people don't care what it looks like when you hand it off to them. Well, right. They care about the quality of it. So like try to use quality methods to capture it. But again, sometimes I think, you know, that capture process can be overwhelming for companies, right? Because then they don't capture it with what? You know what I mean? Is what's the best way to capture it? So I think, you know, figure out what your constraints are, figure out what your budget is and just capture it with the best quality control you can. And then knowing that true data people don't care. Like you could, as long as you've got a good quality set, we can figure out how to make it do something. I mean, I, that's my opinion. I don't know. Ben's smiling at me because either he agrees or he thinks I'm nuts. I don't, I don't know which I mean, like, one it is. All of us data people, we, you know, you say that you know, will handle it, but like come to us clean. Like make that data clean, please. Like I'm begging you, like it makes our life so much easier. <laughs> That's where the data literacy component comes in, right? <laughs> make it clean. Yes, make it clean. Absolutely. I think, I think the quality is the key part there. And I know like, um, so SHIP started, there were a few data scientists on the team when I started at SHIP. Uh, and they had worked with the engineering team to instrument some of our mobile apps just to capture data sometimes, even though to Ben's point, we weren't using it. Um, and certainly the format of that data actually has changed since the early years. But at least when we were gonna go back to build some models, we did have some data all of a sudden available to us that otherwise we wouldn't have to wait months to capture. Um, I think, uh, I, I would say though that probably a lot of the team, they would love to see cleaner data always produced. Um, but that's where we're, we're always working with our partners to sort of enable better and cleaner collection. <laughs> Seth Michael just posted in the chat, never expect clean data, Robin Hunt 2019. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah, that's what I tell all the up and coming Inspire data. Like they're going to hand you stuff you don't know what it's going to look like. It's just, you know, well, you're going to be cleaning it, right? So yeah, thanks for that, Seth, for sure. I think like big companies I've seen, either colleagues or friends, um, often they end up throwing out a lot of data for certain analysis because nobody's got this perfect. Um, but I think it's always sort of the, the moving target, the gold standard everybody's shooting for is for better sort of quality uh, and like cleanliness in that data. So it's um, just like the governance discussion, it's a moving target. Uh, and it's, um, I think, don't let the fact that it's a moving target dissuade you from trying to wrangle it somewhere. It's always going to be a moving target. It's never stopped me to move. Like, again, remember when I said we used to be trying to figure out how to build servers in our closets, mm -hmm. right? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's never, technology just never stops. It's going to constantly grow. And data literacy, the definition of it's going to change and evolve over time as we build a more data, data literate workforce we're going to continue to evolve that uh definition i really truly appreciate you guys being so candid and having this conversation and i think it was uh i think it was fun for me i don't know how everybody else felt so i i feel good about it 
um, something actionable for all of the organizations and people. Of course, you've heard us talk about data literacy to the point you don't want to hear me say it ever again, uh, but don't worry, I'll be saying it a lot. Um, I think remembering Vinay's uh, count and counts is super important and reflecting on Ben's thought on data governance, just right on down to just define what each part of this means. I think that is definitely actionable for all of us going forward. So thanks guys for having this conversation with me. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, yeah, same here. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ben and Vinay. Um, we're so glad that you came back to one of our programs, Vinay. We really enjoyed having you at SPAS Tech last year, and so we're glad that we were able to, to get you into another program for Tech Birmingham, and you didn't have to fly. No, I, I actually, um, one of the, I, I was traveling to Birmingham basically every month for over three years. Oh my um, word. And that, since the, uh, since basically the sheltering and pandemic started, I haven't been to Birmingham since February, so it's, it's been a minute. Oh, uh, well, yeah. well, we can't wait to, to get you back to come to Birmingham, so. Um, and Robin, thank you as always for hosting such a wonderful program. Um, so thank you everybody. Uh, Dion, would you like to send us off with some parting words or a pleasant little wrap? Um, yes, I, I don't know how I top uh, peanut butter spread. I was not expecting uh, that. So I will keep my uh, remarks brief uh, to honor that. <laughs> so, uh, but no, again, thank you all. Uh, Vinay, Robin, Ben, I really uh, appreciate the time. This is what you all do for uh, the community. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you to our attendees. Uh, I think this is a good opportunity also to remind uh, everybody that it is uh, uh, Data Literacy Month and also to lift up the uh, BHAM Knows Data Initiative. Uh, we've actually partnered with Think Data Solutions, uh, VBA, and Quant Hub on that. So uh, long story short, the effort is to make sure that Birmingham is leading the way in terms of data literacy um, and that we're doing everything that we can to uh, make sure we are a data literate, uh, literate community. So uh, please check out BHAM Knows Data dot com. Uh, again, final reminder, these videos are posted along with all others on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash tech And with that said, thank you again and have a great day.